thanks to all of you for being here. And what I want to center on is a concept that is rather simple to say. We could talk about it in a short phrase. We could say, well, can we find the virtue of our faults? And how can we, y how can we take that virtue and make something happen that's constructive? That every fault there's a virtue that can be found, there's an energy in that fault, and that fault is something that can be utilized. Now when I say utilization, that is a kind of sacred word in Ericksonian therapy, because utilization is a core concept in Ericksonian therapy. So a core concept in psychoanalysis might be transference, a core concept in behavior therapy might be desensitization, a core concept in cognitive behavior therapy might be schemas or changing uh, belief systems, negative thoughts into positive thoughts. Uh, a core concept in Ericksonian therapy is utilization. Now, I came across this concept very early in my career. I started learning about hypnosis 1972, 71, 72, I think. And um, then I understood it cognitively. But over the last more than 40 years, it's been a little bit of a struggle to operationalize that concept and move it from the land of knowing to the land of realizing. And in order to realize this concept of utilization and practice it, I keep on working at it. It's a little bit like a musician playing scales. No matter what level you get to as a musician, no matter how great a concert violinist you are, you might still want to go back and practice your scales and keep yourself toned and keep yourself uh, attuned to the instrument and to your particular talents. So utilization is something that, well, if I help you over the course of these two hours that we have together to understand that, that will be good. But if I help you in an even richer way to realize something about utilization, I think that that will make a difference not only in your psychotherapy, but it will make a difference in your life. And I've been really working at this, trying to actualize it, understanding that out of the 400, I believe, I may be exaggerating a little bit, cases that Milton Erickson added to the literature, uh, I am speaking perhaps apocryphally, but I believe that Freud added 13 cases to the literature. And Erickson added like 400 cases to the literature, more cases than anyone, and more cases than probably anybody to come. And all of these cases are based in this simple concept of utilization. That whatever exists in the therapy situation, whatever exists in the uh, patient's uh, environment, the total weave of that environment, can be harnessed, can be utilized. And if the therapist can enter what we'll call a state of utilization, then solutions follow. So we could say that utilization is the foundation of solutions. And I am borrowing this title because it's actually the title of one of the books by Stephen DeShazer. So important is this concept that he titled his book, Utilization, the Foundation of Solutions. And uh, I'm going to try to orient you in a way that is typically Ericksonian. Well, you, you understand that there's a word utilization, and you understand that it can have richness in the practice of psychotherapy. But in order for you to get it, to realize it, I'm going to uh, go on a journey that will uh, take us into a more experiential realm, a storytelling realm, an experiential realm, things that you can feel. Now, let's say that I was going to do a group hypnosis here and now, and I was going to interest you in learning about hypnosis, but in order to really know something about hypnosis, you might want to experience trance. And I could define trance to you as a state in which you allow yourself to effortlessly focus on what is immediately relevant. 
and that once you focus on what is immediate re relevant, you're capable of taking ideas and you're capable of realizing the inherent value of those ideas. You're capable of realizing the personal value of those ideas. And you might have an intellectual interest in hypnosis, and you might have an experiential curiosity about what hypnosis can be like. And in hypnosis, we use concepts like the conscious mind and the unconscious mind. But when we use a concept like the unconscious mind, we're talking about the repository of learnings, things that make the automaticity of everyday life happen. We don't think about brushing our teeth or putting on our glasses or how we're going to uh, put on our shoes. These things happen automatically. And there is a, a great value to the automaticity of everyday functioning. So consciously, as you're here, you may be looking at the screen behind me. You may be noticing something about the movement of my hands. You may be seeing the carpet out of your peripheral vision. You may be noticing changes that can begin to happen in the blink of an eye. But unconsciously, you could be attending, attending to the fact that your feet are on the floor. You could be noticing the pressure of the support of the chair. You could be attending easily, comfor comfortably to the seat rest, to the back rest and beginning to realize how there can be a sense of ease, a sense of peace, a sense of rest inside. But unconsciously, you wouldn't need to attend to the sound of the fan, the air conditioning in the room. You wouldn't really need to attend to the tone and the tempo and the changing tone and the changing tempo of my voice. You could attend to the rhythm, the sound of your own breathing, and you can effortlessly begin, begin to attend to the sound changes that can happen as your body can accommodate to the resting state. Now, could we call that the beginnings of a hypnotic induction? And I think that as I will move forward with this presentation, you'll be begin to understand where that, why that could be the beginnings of a hypnotic induction. Just the fact alone of modifying, helping somebody to change their attention and to change the intensity of their immediate experience may be enough for somebody to classify their experience as being in the state of hypnosis. Now, to ease you in more to this idea of utilization, we're going to uh, look at some cases, some of my cases, some of Erickson's cases, again, with the um, hope and the belief that by teaching in this slightly unusual way that there's more of an opportunity for you to get it. Now, now it's, it's nice, nice to, to get the echoes of reverberating concepts that you can begin to incorporate inside yourself. And it's nice to realize things in multiple levels, in multiple ways. Uh -huh. That's utilization. That's utilization. Uh -huh. And in that sense, there's no real problems. There are challenges, there are opportunities to utilize whatever it is that's happening. Now, some of these cases in Erickson are classic. And I'll give you a few of them and try to increase the level of complexity so that you get this idea. 
Um, Erickson is working in a psychiatric hospital. There's a patient in the psychiatric hospital. If you're a patient in the psychiatric hospital, basically you're powerless, you're impotent because you're locked up, at, especially at the time that Erickson was practicing, you're in a locked ward. Well, part of the paradox of that situation for the patient, this particular patient, is that the patient insists that he's Jesus Christ. And the patient is recalcitrant. Nothing that anybody is able to say is helping this patient to uh, realize the reality of his situation. The patient is uh, saying in a situation that he is basically impotent, that he's all-powerful, that he's God. And the patient is being annoying, trying to convert everybody to Christianity, and they don't know what to do with the patient, so they give the patient to Dr. Erickson. So Dr. Erickson walks up to the man and says, Sir... Yes, my son? Sir, I understand that you have experience as a carpenter. Of course, my son. Well, can you provide assistance? I'd be glad to, my son. Can you assist us in the woodworking shop? Gladly, my son. And Erickson walks the man to the woodworking shop, and the apocryphal end of that story is that the man becomes a carpenter at the hospital. Now that is utilizing the patient's metaphor. Another patient uh, comes to Erickson, and that patient also hospitalized, a businessman, and he's had many ups and downs in his life. And so the man develops a compulsion. And the compulsion is that the man can stop, can't stop moving his arm up and down. Now, if you're coming from certain schools of psychotherapy, you might want to interpret the man's behavior and explain to the man that having had many ups and downs in his career, his compulsion is a representation, a symbolic representation of his psychological struggles. But if you're into the mentality of utilization, you would know that an interpretation is not necessarily something that's going to benefit the person. So Erickson starts working with the man and he gets the man to move his arm faster. And the man can't stop moving his arm. And then gradually, Erickson starts to get the man so he's moving his arm on a diagonal. And the man can't stop moving his arm. And then more of a diagonal. And the man can't stop moving his arm. And then eventually he has the man moving his hand horizontally and he can't stop moving. And then Erickson takes this man down to the woodworking shop, puts sandpaper in his hand, <laughs> and gets him sandy wood. All roads lead to carpentry. <laughs> All roads may lead to carpentry. <laughs> okay, now let's extend that into a case that is more complex, an Erickson case. A couple comes to Erickson, and the presenting problem is the wife's alcoholism. And it seems that the wife has a little hobby. And her little hobby is that all weekend long, she's gardening. And while she's gardening, she's taking drinks of a hidden bottle of whiskey. Now, the husband has confronted the wife, complained to the wife, criticized the wife, that her little hobby is bad for her health and bad for the relationship. But the wife continues her little hobby with impunity. Now, in the interview, Dr. Erickson finds out that the wife has a complaint because the husband has a little hobby. And the husband's little hobby is that all weekend long, he sits in the same chair in the living room, reading, according to the wife, dusty old books, dusty old magazines, and dusty old newspapers. Now, the wife has criticized the husband, counseled the husband, and confronted the husband, and explained to the husband that his little hobby is bad for his health and bad for the relationship, but the husband continues his hobby with impunity. In the interview, Dr. Erickson finds out that the couple has a camping bus, but they haven't been using this camping bus, it's just collected dust. And he also finds out that the couple has an aversion to fishing. They hate fishing. Now, how would you start to conceptualize that case? How would you start to think about intervening if those were the only facts that you had at your disposal? Now, one thing that you could do is you could explain to the couple something about their relationship pattern. You could say, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, you are engaged in passive-aggressive behavior. And you'd be right, 
but would that necessarily be an op, uh, something that would help them to change their behavior? You could say, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, you're engaged in an escalating symmetric relationship. You would be right. You would be using a different lens for examining the couple. If you were going to use a historical lens, you might say, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, you're taking your adolescent impunity, your adolescent rebellion, and you're bringing your adolescent rebellion into your relationship. Marriage is a crucible. Marriage is a search for healing, and you need to get through this in order to move yourself psychologically and relationally into a better place. It would be a perfectly adequate explanation, and of course, being into that utilization mentality, it was not what Erickson did. What Erickson did was something that we might not be able to do in contemporary practice. He told Mrs. Smith, because of ethical reasons, he told Mrs. Smith, go out and buy a bottle of whiskey. Bring the bottle of whiskey inside the house. When Mr. Smith comes home from work, he'll have one hour to find the bottle of whiskey because you're going to hide the bottle of whiskey. Now, if Mr. Smith finds the bottle of whiskey within one hour, you can't drink. But if Mr. Smith doesn't find the bottle of whiskey within one hour, you can drink with impunity in your home. Now, Mrs. Smith loves this assignment, and she thinks it's really great. And she finds, a bottle, she finds a place to hide a bottle of whiskey that no man would possibly ever find within one hour. But somehow, after four or five days of doing this, it doesn't seem like fun anymore. And they come back to Erickson for the next session. And Erickson looks at them sternly, as if he's confronting them, as if he's criticizing them, as if he's counseling them. And he says, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, go fishing. They say, well, we told you, we explained to you, we don't like fishing, we hate it. Go fishing. Well, what, what are you talking about? We told you, we don't want to go fishing, we don't like fishing. You will go fishing. Well, we're not going fishing. Go fishing. What are you talking about? You will go fishing. Why? Well, it's the only proper therapy for you, Erickson explains. Mrs. Smith, if you're in a little boat in the middle of a lake, there's no possible place to hide a bottle of whiskey. Mr. Smith, if you're in a little boat in the middle of a lake, there's no possible place for dusty old books, dusty old magazines, and dusty old newspapers. Go fishing. Well, what do Mr. and Mrs. Smith do? They do what they know how to do. They act with impunity. They don't go fishing. They go camping. <laughs> they take out their camping bus, and they start to develop a new little hobby, and that new little hobby is exploring Arizona together. And in the process of doing that, Mr. Smith voluntarily gives up his little hobby. Mrs. Smith voluntarily gives up her little hobby. So one aspect of therapy can be that whatever the person is doing, which could be acting with impunity in some context, can be useful. A systemic principle is that if you have two warring parties, give them a common enemy, they'll come together to fight that common enemy. When Mao Zedong uh, was fighting against Chiang Kai-shek and the Japanese invaded Manchuria, Mao Zedong and Chiang Kai-shek had to come together to fight in 1937 to fight the Japanese, even though they were at war with each other. It's a systemic principle. And if somebody's hiding, rather than analyzing the hiding, rather than using that psychiatrically as grist, grist for the therapeutic mill, a possibility is to utilize the hiding, take control of the hiding. And then when the symptom is being done under voluntary direction, perhaps not so voluntary, but direction from the therapist, the symptom may take on a different valence just because it's now being prescribed and it's not being done automatically. Most symptoms need to happen in a dissociative way. So I sat down to eat and suddenly the plate was empty and I don't know how the plate got to be empty because I don't even remember how that happened. Or suddenly the package of cigarettes was empty or suddenly I went into this place and I had a panic or I woke up this morning and my depression just came over me. So a characteristic of symptoms 
for the most part, is that they need to happen in, a some, in some way that's dissociative, in some way that's automatic, in some way that's involuntary. And so when the therapist takes charge and makes the symptomatic pattern more voluntary, that may be a systemically significant intervention. A case that uh, I, w I don't know if I mentioned in a previous lecture, but this is a, a case where I was involved and I am visiting Dr. Erickson and it's uh, probably around 1975. I started going to Phoenix in 1973. I moved to Phoenix to be close to Dr. Erickson in 1978 and he passed away in 1980. And effectively, I took over Dr. Erickson's practice because he didn't really have somebody to refer to in Phoenix. And so I went there to work at a hospital, and then he re started referring patients to me, and I went into private practice. But during those early years, as frequently as I was capable of doing, I came to Phoenix to spend time with him, to learn from him. And I was his house guest. Uh, how this happened, I have no idea. But at that time in my life, I had no money. And so it was uh, a great benefit that I was able to stay at his home and, uh, uh, and sleep there and while I was visiting. And even uh, the courtesy of Mrs. Erickson was enormous because I didn't necessarily have enough money to take a taxi cab from the airport if I could get the airfare. And she would pick me up at the, uh, at the airport and then drive me to the Erickson home. So Dr. Erickson is seeing a patient. His office was in his home, and this was part of the convenience because he had had post-polio syndrome and suffered from a, a lot of uh, medical problems, so it was easier for him. And so I say to him as I'm visiting, can you're, you're, he was at the end of his practice years, and I say, well, when you're seeing a patient, can I sit in? Can I observe? And he says, no. And that was pretty uncharacteristic because he had a very experiential way of, of speaking and didn't tend to speak in short, uh, direct sentences. He said, these are not clinic patients. These are private patients. It wouldn't be appropriate for you to sit in on the session. I said, fine. And I went into the next room. There was a bedroom that was pretty close to his office. And I'm resting. Suddenly, there's a knock at the door. I come to the door, and there is this stunning woman. And it looks like the cover of a fashion magazine. And I think, am I awake? Am I dreaming? <laughs> and she says, Dr. Erickson wants to see you. So I say, uh, OK, fine. And I get myself uh, uh, somewhat refreshed, and I come into his office. And she's sitting in the chair. And next to the chair, there's a little table. And on the table, there's a pair of sunglasses, and I'm sitting in the adjacent chair. And Dr. Erickson says, Jeff, this is Kathy. Kathy said that she wore her sunglasses to protect herself against the hostile world. But I said, you don't need those sunglasses here with me. And they were on the table between us, little coffee table. And then Dr. Erickson quickly turned to Kathy and said, Kathy, this is Jeff Zeig. He's a therapist from California. This is before I had my PhD. I was a marriage and family therapist, and I was living in Northern California. And Kathy said, oh, a student? And Dr. Erickson said, no, a therapist. And then he looked at me and he said, isn't she beautiful? And I said, well, yeah. And he said, well, doesn't she have pretty eyes? And I said, uh-huh. And he said, well, doesn't she have beautiful lips? And I said, well, yeah. And uh, aren't her lips kissable? And I said, uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm thinking, am I in a trance? Is she in a trance? Am I the patient? Is she the patient? What is happening here? And he's going on, doesn't she have beautiful legs? And he's getting animated. He's in a wheelchair. And he's getting animated. Doesn't she have uh, uh, lovely clothes? Wouldn't she make a wonderful wife? Now I start to sweat. <laughs> because he had already tried to interest me in a previous patient. <laughs> and then, after this goes on for some period of time, like a David Copperfield magic trick, Erickson disappears. Well, Mrs. Uh, Dr. Erickson had a buzzer 
underneath his desk. And when I was so pixelated by trying to understand what was happening, he probably pressed the button and Mrs. Erickson rushed out and took him out of the office uh, uh, and into uh, the main house. And I'm left alone with Kathy. A and uh, I don't know what to do and so I say goodbye to her and she leaves. And then a couple of minutes later, while well, I'm walking around the office trying to tr make sense out of this experience and trying to understand, contextualize it in some way, there's a knock on the door, she's returned, and sheepishly, she says to me, I forgot my sunglasses. And so I give her her sunglasses, and uh, she leaves, and then I am thinking, well, when Dr. Erickson stopped speaking, it wasn't proper, it wasn't good manners to interrupt him, but I went and found Mrs. Erickson, and I said, can I see Dr. Erickson? I want to tell him something about what happened in the session with Kathy. So she asked, and Dr. Erickson said, sure. And so I come in breathlessly saying to Dr. Erickson, Kathy forgot her sunglasses. And he's just nodding. And I said, you expected that. And he's just nodding. And I said, you set it up. And he's nodding. And I said, well, how did you do it? He said, well, she said that she wore her sunglasses to protect herself against the hostile world. And I told her, you don't need them in here with me. And then before you came in, I told her stories. I told her boring stories. Stories like, you know, you want something and so you go shopping, but you're not exactly sure if that's what you want. And you look at the item and you look at it carefully and then you decide that you're going to move on and go to some other place and you go to a second store and you see something else but you're thinking about what you found in the first store and then you go to a third store and at the third store you decide you're going to go back and purchase what you had wanted at the first store and now knowing that you really want it and suddenly you realize you forgot your keys at the second store. And as he was telling these stories, not as overtly as I just did, but in much more of an implicit way, he would glance at the sunglasses when he talked about the concept of forgetting. And then he told me the story of Kathy, that Kathy grew up in a family where she didn't have a father and she had a mother and an aunt who spoke in a derogatory way to her, putting her down, accusing her of not being a real woman. So Kathy dressed in a hyper-feminine way because she had an insecurity about her femininity. So Dr. Erickson wanted to do something that would help Kathy to build her self-esteem. So he brought me into the room. Now I was giving compliments to Kathy, but I wasn't really giving compliments to Kathy. He was giving compliments to Kathy, but he wasn't giving compliments to Kathy. I was giving the compliments to Kathy. So Kathy, who had a tendency, didn't uh, know what to do in that situation, and it was much more salutary for her to just accept the compliments. And I learned something about my ability to tolerate pressure. So if you had sunglasses, you could find a way to utilize them. If you had a young man who was visiting, you could find a way to utilize him. And when Kathy forgot her sunglasses, Dr. Erickson said, Jeff, she's starting to believe in me. And suddenly I understood something else that was implicit in Erickson's work, which was how to build responsiveness to the understructure of communication, how to build responsiveness to the meaning of communication, how to build responsiveness to the evocative aspect of communication. Communication is both informative and communication is evocative. And in when we learn psychotherapy, at least when I learned psychotherapy, what I learned to do is I learned to use the informative channel of communication. I never learned to use the evocative channel of communication. And when I saw Erickson, he was somebody who wasn't using the informative aspect of communication. He was solely using the evocative channel of communication. And the research in this is in social psychology. The purview of social psychology is learning how we respond 
implicitly without necessarily realizing the cues that led to our response without necessarily realizing the response. And social psychology has studied this and Erickson was a quintessential social psychologist before social psychology existed. If I say, here's a table. Well, there's an evocative aspect to my communication. When I emphasize with my fist, I'm saying this is strong. And uh, you know, to try to get that across to you in a very simple sentence, uh, I think will necessarily fail. But um, the concept there is that uh, we, uh, th that Erickson, more than any other therapist in history, attuned himself to this evocative channel of communication and used that evocative channel of communication in helping person, in stimulating people, helping them to realize they could do different, they could be different, they could experience and perceive the world in a different way. Let's um, think of another case of, of Erickson because I still want to intrigue you, interest you, and start to challenge you to think about what is the virtue of our fault? How can we find something useful in a problem? So Dr. Erickson is invited by a family physician to go to the home of a patient. The patient is dying of cancer. The patient, none of the medical treatments of the day are helpful. The patient is in acute and chronic pain and the family physician doesn't know what to do, but the patient is home because that's where she wants to do her dying. And so Dr. Erickson is invited with Dr. England to come and see this patient. And when Dr. Erickson walks into the house, the patient is chanting, don't hurt me, don't scare me, don't hurt me, don't scare me, don't hurt me, don't scare me, don't hurt me, don't scare me. And she's lying in a fetal position on her bed. Now, what would you do if you're confronted by that kind of a situation? And how are you going to approach the situation? Are you going to say, uh, excuse me, could you stop chanting for a moment? I want to introduce myself. I'm Dr. Zeig. I'm going to do hypnosis with you to help you with your pain. I would like you to give me informed consent that you will allow me to use these hypnotic procedures. And some of the procedures that I'm going to use are based on using evocative communication. Can you please agree to this treatment plan and sign off on it? Well, it's not going to be very helpful. But if you're in the mentality of utilization and you're Milton Erickson, what would you do? There's the patient in a fetal position. Don't hurt me, don't scare me, don't hurt me, don't scare me. And what does Erickson do? He starts chanting. He says, I'm gonna hurt you, I'm gonna scare you, I'm gonna hurt you, I'm gonna scare you, I'm gonna hurt you, I'm gonna scare you, I'm gonna hurt you, I'm gonna scare you. And she says, but I don't want you to hurt me. He says, but I've gotta hurt you to help you, I've gotta hurt you to help you, I've gotta hurt you to help you. And he continues the chant. And then, he's, then he changes and he says, okay, Kathy, I want you to remember what it was when you turned over from your left side to your right side. I really want you to remember that. And what he was doing, like I started, which was guiding your attention in an unusual way, is he was guiding her attention to the memory of pain because it was very painful for her to move from her left side to the right side. And he was using her memory of pain as an absorption device. You know, like in classical hypnosis, somebody's looking at a spinning disc or a, a, a candle or a spot on the wall, and we're doing something in, in the beginning of an induction to fixate the person's attention, to modify the patient's attention, to modify the immediate perceptual experience. Well, he was using the memory of pain. And then Kathy said, I, I think I'm on my left side. I, I think I'm on my left side. And then Dr. S uh, Erickson said, okay, Kathy, what I'd like you to do now is to go inside and I want you to develop the most painful, the most intolerable itch that you can possibly create in the base of your foot. And then Kathy shortly said, Dr. Erickson, I can't develop a painful itch. All that I can develop is a horrible numb sensation. 
And Erickson said, all right, Kathy, you can only feel that horrible numb sensation. I'd like you to allow that numb sensation to begin to develop and to feel that numb sensation as it moves from the base of your foot, up your legs, across your body, except that area where your left breast used to be. And uh, he helps her to create a hypnotic anesthesia using that numb feeling. And he leaves an area where there's going to be discomfort. He leaves an area where there's going to be pain because he knows that when people have problems like that, they're going to take something out on themselves. They're going to do something that they need to do something, have some channel to take out things on themselves. And also a strategic principle, a principle that is part of the Mental Research Institute is don't cure the patient 100% give the patient something to do that they can activate to help themselves. So that's another situation where being in this mentality of utilization, response readiness, ready to s respond constructively to whatever exists in the total weave of the therapy situation. There's a, a case of a man, he's got some sexual problem. I don't remember if it's premature ejaculation or impotence, but Dr. Erickson is working with the man and he's doing a fantasy induction. And the fantasy induction is that the man is walking down a path. And the man is seeing things on the path, like he's seeing the cracks in the sidewalk. But as he's seeing the cracks in the sidewalk, he's experiencing some things. And Dr. Erickson is speaking on multiple levels and talking with the man about the things that he experiences on the path and that as he experiences these things on the path, there'll be certain resources that come up, certain feelings, certain ideas, certain strengths that come up and give him some new understandings that are going to be helpful to him in this fantasy encounter that he's going to have in the house. And as Dr. Erickson is talking with the man, he's talking about the sidewalk, he's talking about the steps, he's talking about how many steps there are. And suddenly the patient realizes, he, oh, he's talking about my sidewalk. He's talking about the things that I see on my steps. He's talking about my steps, he's talking about my house. And Dr. Erickson had sent one of his children to go to the house to take a photograph of the house so that Dr. Erickson could do an induction and create this induction so that it was um, specific to the patient. Now, if you go that extra step and you do something like that, it gives your therapy uh, a, a, an, an additional boost, an additional credence. And this was part of Erickson. I can remember another story where a patient uh, was a friend uh, uh, there was a, a, a friend of the family, he happened to also be a patient, and he referred a friend of his to Dr. Erickson, and the man had a fear of getting lost. And so Dr. Erickson met with him for a session, and then Sunday morning, like eight in the morning, the patient hears a knock on his door, he goes to the door, and there's Dr. Erickson. What is my doctor doing at my door at eight in the morning on a Sunday? And Dr. Erickson says, well, let's go out on a drive. And so they go out on a drive. And Dr. Erickson says, well, let's go to this place. And they go to this place and they do something. And then they take something from here and they move it over there. And they go to this place and get something there and move it back here and go to this place. And suddenly they're lost. And the man's fear was getting lost. And Dr. Erickson has the man live through his phobia. But going to that kind of remarkable extent and going to that remarkable extent with his family. This was Erickson's way of doing family therapy. Erickson's way of doing family therapy was his family did therapy with the patient. And the children were involved in uh, the therapy situation because oftentimes the therapy was done inside uh, the Erickson home and the living room was the waiting room. The first example that intrigued me with Erickson, that intrigued me with utilization. It's about 1971, 72. I'm in my master's program at um, San Francisco State University. I would say it must have been 1972. And I have a, I'm at a, com at a community hospital. I loved working with schizophrenic patients. 
And I um, will tell you another story about working with schizophrenic patients just in just a minute. just ca came to my mind. And I um, have a supervisor, and he's a psychiatrist. And I have another supervisor who's a psychologist who's psychodynamic in his orientation, who was very brilliant therapist and whose work I was e trying to emulate at the time. And the psychiatrist, uh, Dr. O'Connor, I said, uh, could you please uh, teach me something about hypnosis? Because he has had some expertise in hypnosis and I was a new, st I was a young graduate student and I wanted to learn something about hypnosis. So Dr. O'Connor said, come to my office on Saturday morning, I'll hypnotize you. And I went, oh! <gasps> because uh, I didn't expect that. I thought that this was going to be a cognitive learning and not something experiential, but I was now hooked into it. And so I went to his office on Saturday morning and I was nervous, I was scared. I thought I was going to lose control or be asked to do something that was embarrassing. And in my nervousness on the arm of the chair, I was unconsciously drumming my fingers. And Dr. Erickson uh, and Dr. O'Connor said, watch your fingers. And then he said, notice the rhythm of movement of your fingers. And he said, notice how the rhythm of movement changes. And as the rhythm slows down, you can begin to close your eyes. And this was my first example of utilization. And it really intrigued me. I didn't even have a word for it at that time. And I said, well, what should I read? And he said, read Milton Erickson. And I said, who? And he said, there's a book, Advanced Techniques of Hypnosis and Therapy, which is a compilation of Dr. Erickson's papers. It's long out of print now. And it was a very expensive book, and I was a poor graduate student, and I ordered the book. And uh, it was light years beyond anything that I had previously conceptualized as being psychotherapy. And I uh, started to learn about Erickson's approach. And I then wrote a paper, because I was working with schizophrenic patients. And it was a paper about using utilization in working with the auditory hallucinations of schizophrenics. I thought, well, if a, a good hypnotic subject can have a hallucination, then a schizophrenic patient can change their hallucination. So what I did was, before I met Dr. Erickson, I said to the schizophrenic patient, listen carefully, and as you're listening, hear your voices. And then I would give them time to orient to their voices, and then I would say, okay, where are your voices coming from? Localize your voices in space. And so one young man said that his voices were coming from the left side of his head, and I said, well, what are your voices like? And in his schizophrenic language, he said, the voices were a bridge over troubled waters. And so I said, okay, listen carefully and notice as the voices become louder and indicate to me when you've done that. And if you're working with somebody who's paranoid, you're not going to want to say to them, close your eyes and focus inside, but you might want to increase their awareness of something, which would be good hypnotic technique. And so then when the boy indicated, the young man indicated that his voices were louder, I said, okay, um, you want to get things right and some things are better left behind, so allow your voices to move from the left side of your head to the right side of your head and indicate to me when you've done that. And then he said, okay. And I said, well, your voices are a bridge over troubled water, so I'd let your voices flow and they can flow through your body until you can begin to feel your voices coming from your hand. Now, if you have something in hand, metaphorically, you've got control of it. And then I said to the young man that his hand, that he could take his hand and he could begin to drop his voices from his hand. And that as he dropped the voices, his hand would become numb and stiff and semi-paralyzed. Now, I was one of the two therapists at this subacute residential treatment center and this was uh, where the, the people who were patients in the center were also responsible for doing some of the chores. So I released him from doing his chores, and he's walking around uh, the unit with this paralyzed uh, arm. 
And then after some period of time, I brought him back and I said, okay, turn your hand over, collect tension in the shape of a ball. And what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to squeeze that tension into your hand. And as you squeeze that tension into your hand, you'll begin to again hear, hear voices. And then I'd like you to allow your voices to flow. And I'd like you to allow your voices to move to a prearranged spot near his heart where they could be perhaps as loud as his own heartbeat. And then, like a radio, he could turn up the voices, and if he needed information, or if he was lonely, or if he needed advice, he could turn up the channel. And so the whole procedure was done in a way of reframing the voices and utilizing the metaphors, utilizing the voices as a fixation device. And this was the first paper that I sent to Dr. Erickson, introducing myself to him and asking if I could come and learn from him. I sent him a preprint before the paper was published. And I did that with a whole series of patients. And uh, it was my way of working with schizophrenic patients, like um, helping them to do symptom control. If you can get control of one symptom, if you can make one change the valence of one symptom, then you can move on and change the valence of other symptoms. I can uh, remember another patient who came to me, and we'll call her Pat. And the VA hospital in Phoenix called me, and they said, will you see this patient? She's a very difficult patient. She's been slashing herself. Now. She was in the hospital, in the VA hospital, because she was slashing herself. And um, when she was slashing herself, she went into the hospital. But when she was in the hospital, she resented the hospital and didn't cooperate very well with the routine. And she'd been in and out of the hospital a number of times. But when she was out of the hospital, she slashed herself and got in the hospital. So as with many patients of this kind of diagnostic way of thinking, you, she had an ambivalent relationship. And as it turned out, she had a, an ambivalent relationship with her parents. And even though she was an adult, she was living with her parents. And they were going to take charge. And I said, OK, I'll see the patient. They were, she was being discharged on Friday. I think they called me on Monday. I said, I have an opening in my schedule on Thursday. Uh, have the patient and her parents come to see me because she was going to live with them. And so they come into my office. My office happens to be in my home. And Pat, the patient, is absolutely sullen. She doesn't want to be in my office. And she doesn't want to talk to me. And she, at this point, wants to be back in the hospital, except that they were discharging her. And she was going to leave the hospital on Friday. I find out that her father was a military man. But he just had some cardiac surgery. He'd recently had cardiac surgery. And uh, he was smoking. And I found out that Pat had a very dear relationship at this point in time with her father and more of an ambivalent relationship with her mother. So I met with the three of them. Pat's not talking to me. Fine. And I find out a little bit of the story. And then I meet independently with the father and find out his story independently with the mother. And she didn't seem that she was going to be so immediately relevant because there wasn't so much constructive energy there. And then I met individually with Pat. And I found out from Pat that she was a very responsible person. She had some talents. And when she agreed to do something, she did it. So I brought back Pat and her father. And I start talking very sternly to the father. And again, Pat is not so um, open to being with me. And I say to Pat, you sit there and you sit there quietly. I'm going to talk to your father. And I say to him sternly, you're a military man. How dare you? You want me to take your daughter as a patient. I will agree to take your daughter as long as you follow orders. And how dare you? You want me to stop your daughter from slashing at her wrist while you, who have just had cardiac surgery, continue to be a smoker. How dare you be so hypocritical? Now, I'll agree to take your daughter. You stop smoking. Now, should you smoke in any way, 
Pat will be free to slash it herself. And Pat starts crying. She says, I, I can't make that promise. I say, Pat, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to your father. And then I make an agreement with Pat that Pat's going to pay for the therapy, but she doesn't have any money. So she's going to give me her time in return for the therapy. And we agree on what a per hour fee is. And we agree on something that she has talent for, which is making needlepoint. And so she, who is going to be very responsible, has to keep track of all of the hours. And I start seeing her a couple of times a week. So she owes me a lot of hours. And she needs to make needlepoint for me. Now, if you ever come to the Erickson Foundation, you will see hundreds of hours of needlepoint, <laughs> beautiful needlepoint. But the paradox of that was that here in the hospital, they were taking away all these sharp objects from her, and I'm giving her sharp objects to use, but she can't cut herself because she owes me the time. <laughs> and she needs her hands to be able to, to uh, do the needlepoint. So that was another example of utilization, utilize what's going on. I can remember another case, and that other case is a, a, a boy, a father calls me, he's a working class man, and he is the, res he's a, the, the uh, primary caretaking parent for this 10-year-old boy, and the 10-year-old boy has developed a phobia, and the phobia is a fear of gravel roads which is then generalized and he's more afraid to leave the house. The family, working class family, has called a psychologist. The psychologist said he would need four hours of assessment to create a treatment plan before he could do therapy with the boy. The family didn't have that much money. And uh, they uh, you know, weren't very psychologically sophisticated. The mother was a low level health professional. And the father was doing odd jobs, but it was the summer he was caring for the boy. And so I said, okay, well, if you can bring in your wife and the child, I will see all three of you together. And I made an appointment. I happened to make an appointment for two weeks later because my schedule was full. And the family came one week early, which was actually okay because I was seeing a physician that hour. She was running late, and she agreed that she would swap sessions with the family. And the little boy came in, and this is the most hyperactive child I have ever seen in my private practice. I used to work as a child psychologist in a psychiatric hospital. I've seen some severely disturbed children, but this was the most hyperactive child I've ever seen. This boy came into my office, and he's electric. He just filled with tension, and plaintively says as he's walking in the door, I'm the crazy person. And that was so sad, and my heart went out to him. And so the, the, the uh, family sits down, and I give the boy a puzzle. And it's a two-piece puzzle, and the two pieces fit together to make a pyramid. And it's amazing that you can bisect a pyramid into two pieces, but this is a, a, a real puzzle. And it's a puzzle that not many people have solved in my office. And I give the boy the puzzle, and I say, I'm good at helping families to solve puzzles because I want to reframe the problem as a puzzle that's going to be solved by the family. And the little boy can't sit still and he can't solve the puzzle, which by the way is difficult. I couldn't solve it when I first got it. I had to call somebody and ask for a solution. And uh, I take the boy out of my office into the waiting room and I show the boy how to do the puzzle. And I say, go into the office and give the puzzle to your mother, give the puzzle to your father. Because I want take two. I want the boy to come in with a better sense than defining himself as I'm the crazy person. So now he comes in and he's walking in a little more proudly because he knows something that his parents don't know. And then I say, channeling Michael White, Michael White, narrative therapy, externalize the problem. I say, uh, Mr. Fear has attacked this family. And what, I asked the boy, what is Mr. can you be Mr. Fear and can you attack your family? And this is a Gestalt principle. A Gestalt principle is if you're in terror, 
play out the terrorizer. If you feel like you're a victim to yourself, play out the victimizer. It's a simple gestalt principle. So the little boy gets up and he is playing out being Mr. Fear, attacking his family. And then I channel Milton Erickson for a moment and I say analogically, what is Mr. Fear like? And the boy says, do you watch Power Rangers? And I say, no. And he says, well, Mr. Fear is drill a monster. I don't know, drill a monster. I say, okay, be drill a monster and attack your family. Well, the boy can't sit still. So he becomes drill a monster and he uh, pantomimes attacking his family. And then he sits down in the chair and I say to the boy, well, you're a power ranger. What power do you have? And the boy says, well, I know karate. So I say, okay, use karate and fight drill a monster. So the little boy is parodying being a karate master and he pushes drill a monster out the door. I think this is great. So he sits back down in the chair and I say, well, you know, your parents are power rangers and they have powers too. What power does your mother have? And he says, well, my mother has a very powerful scream. <laughs> I, I say, well, what power does your father have? He says, well, my father is a, is a sumo wrestler. Now, physiologically, the, uh, uh, from his phys physiognomy, the father is smaller than me. But to this 10-year-old boy, his father looks like he is a uh, sumo wrestler. So I say, okay, well, then it's going to be easy if drill a monster attacks this family, then uh, uh, the Power Rangers are going to get together and they're going to decide how they're going to use their powers. Well, the boy is perfectly satisfied with this as a solution. Now, I had found out in the interview that what the boy was afraid of is he was afraid of being out of control. It seemed that the family was on an outing and the family um, was in a car, the car had a mechanical problem, the father was a really good driver, brought the car to a safe stop, but grandmother was in the back seat with the boy. She panicked, the boy panicked, and then he developed this phobia. And so I said to them as a task, that because mother was exhausted from dealing with a special needs child and she was the primary wage earner, and father was doing odd jobs and they had the boy on a, a, a stimulant holiday for the summer and this boy really needed stimulants to, to, stay, to stay focused. And I said to the father and the boy that I was going to give them a couple of assignments. One of the assignments was that they would go out in the morning and for five minutes they would be out of control. And father would be out of control for five minutes and the little boy would give him instructions about how he could do a better job of being out of control. And then um, the little boy would be out of control for five minutes. Actually, I said that first. And father would give him instructions about how he could do a better job of being out of control. Because if you're working with a child, one principle is if you can turn the symptom into a game, it has more relevance to the child because children are oriented to uh, playing games. So, and then uh, I implied that the whole session, the whole therapy was going to be one session and really took only about 30 minutes. And so then I had the child out playing and met with the parents and talked with them, empathized with them about some of the difficulties of dealing with a special needs child. I'll tell one other story and then uh, give you perhaps a little clip of Dr. Erickson and let him tell a story that's classic about Erickson's way of utilization. I, um, December 1973, I'm visiting Dr. Erickson for the first time and I have no idea why I'm going and uh, what an honor that I have time to, sp that I get time to spend with this genius. And it was before he was really popular because Uncommon Therapy came out at the end of 1973, and that was the book that really brought him into the limelight of psychotherapy. If you haven't read Uncommon Therapy, that's a wonderful place to start, written by Jay Haley, and it is very easy reading. It's like reading O. Henry short stories, where they all build up to this denouement of utilization, and suddenly there's a twist. 
and uh, I think it's really one of the most important books that I've ever read about psychotherapy and it's a classic. It took Haley five years to write that book and organize Erickson's cases in a family life cycle format. And this was a radically new concept that problems in human life group at transition points in the development of a family. So that when a child is born, when the child goes to school, when a child leaves home, when a grandparent dies, problems group at transition points, normal transition points, in the life cycle of a family. And Eric and Haley casts Erickson's cases that way. So I get to visit Dr. Erickson. I've studied something about hypnosis. I know more about traditional hypnosis than I know about um, Ericksonian approaches to hypnosis. I'm in his office for the first time. Yay! Uh -huh. I'm, I'm in his office for the first time and uh, I'm waiting for him and he's wheeled into the office. He's in a wheelchair, post-polio syndrome. He pushes himself painfully from his wheelchair, flops down in the office chair and he's looking at the floor. Now I'm the only person in the room and I've learned all of my life when you're with somebody you look at them and he's looking at the floor. So I look at the floor, and there's nothing on the floor. And I say, well, can I set up my tape recorder? And he nods, looking at the floor. So I go out of the room, I get my tape recorder, and I put my tape recorder on. And he starts talking to the floor. And he says, this purple telephone, and there's a purple telephone on the desk, was a gift from four graduate students, two of whom were passing their majors and failing their minors, and two of whom were passing their minors and failing their majors. And the two who were passing their majors and failing their minors passed all. And the two who were passing their minors and failing their majors passed their majors and failed their minors. In other words, they selected the help I offered. And then he looked at me and said, concerning psychotherapy, and I went, <gasps> because he looked at me for the first time, and I saw those steel gray eyes, and I, I was shocked. And that was a confusion induction of hypnosis. And I had studied the confusion induction, but I was so confused that I had a complete amnesia of that induction. I was in a study group in Northern California learning hypnosis. And I said to, to the study group, I visited Milton Erickson, I want to play you the tape. And so I put on the tape and I went, oh, because I had a complete amnesia of that majors and minors confusion. And I didn't know that I could do that. I didn't know that I had any capacity in, in that regard in hypnosis. Now, about five years later, I'm practicing in Phoenix. A psychologist by the name of Don calls me. And he says, I call Dr. Erickson. He's no longer able to be helpful, but I'd like supervision in Ericksonian therapy. Can you help? He referred me to you. I said, sure. So Don comes to see me, and I say, well, what's your previous experience? He says, you know, when I was a graduate student, myself and three other graduate students visited Erickson. And he said, you know that purple telephone? We bought that for him as a gift. I said, Don, I want to play a tape for you. <laughs> so I played the tape of my initial introduction to Eric, and he said, yeah, that's pretty much right. Two of us became psychologists, and two of us didn't. So he utilized what was immediately available and created uh, a confusion induction and a completely memorable experience for me. Now, I could go on because I have more cases, but I think I'd like you to hear a little clip of Erickson. It'll be a stretch. It's a three-minute clip of Dr. Erickson, but I think you'll be able to, to, to hear that and enjoy it if I can move the slides. Oh, you can move the slides for me? My clicker doesn't work. I'm going to the girl with uh, the split teeth. 
girl with a white face, split teeth. Uh, instead of being ashamed and never showing her upper teeth, she never showed her upper teeth. Uh, that horrible habit. That horrible I habit. Turned out to her that she really had a jewel that she could use. She had a jewel that this she could use. This girl first came into me. Her hair was. Badly combed. Hair badly combed. Her stockings were twisted and wrinkled at the ankles. One shoestring was tied, one was not. Her hem was hanging down on one side. Where hem hanging down, uh, stockings twisted. It didn't come out. Her dress really didn't fit her. She dress had didn't fit her. nail polish and a couple of nails. Polish on only a couple of nails. She was depressed and she was suicidal. Depressed, suicidal. And she wanted to pay me in advance because she was pretty certain she was going to commit suicide. She wanted to pay August. me in advance because she thought you would commit uh, suicide. But she would like to know something agreeable and happy. Her parents had been killed in an automobile accident. Her parents killed. She was 18. She'd been on her own, alone, an orphan. She worked in a uh, an office with an a handsome young man there. Worked in an office as a handsome young man. She wanted a date with him, but the what man in his desperate. right mind would walk a girl with a great big hole in the front of her mouth. I pointed out to her that men had peculiar tastes. Men have peculiar and tastes. that they did like to meet a woman who had her own unique ways of attracting them. And like I a woman who has her own ways spent quite a bit of time in the Trent State teaching that girl that before she committed suicide in next August, for heaven's sake, at least for one good practical joke in life. And uh, I had her practice in privacy of her room, filling her mouth full of water, and then squirting it out between her teeth. And... <laughs> When she developed into an aim, I told her, now you go down to that drinking fountain where you work. Now, uh, you've told me that the young man is very likely to try to meet you there, and you always die. So why don't you fill your mouth full of water, step around the corner. When he comes down, spray him, and then run like hell. <laughs> I can tell you exactly what happened. She did exactly that. She found a sudden panic started running. He looked to her, chased after her, grabbed her, and said, you little bitch, this is what I'm going to do to you. And he proceeded to give her a royal kissing. Uh, 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 she's married. She's got uh, children. She's very, very happy. And uh, she's sent quite a number of patients. She always sends her regards to those patients. And she always tells uh, these people she sends these patients, uh, <coughs> do anything Dr. Erickson tells you to do. <laughs> uh -huh. Yes. Got it? We did the best we could to clear up the sound from that 1960s lecture. So utilization, so after cases, experiences, utilization, more content. Utilization is the readiness of the therapist to respond strategically, to respond constructively to all aspects of the, of the patient, all aspects of the environment. Utilization is not a technique. Utilization is a state. When my patient comes in, suddenly I shift and I'm in a utilization state. And utilization is the first trance, it's the trance of the therapist. The therapist is response ready, ready to respond constructively to whatever it is that exists in the total weave of the therapeutic situation. This is what Erickson said about utilization, 1965. Therapists willing to help their patients should never scorn, condemn, or reject, or analyze, any part of the patient's conduct simply because it's obstructive, unreasonable, or even irrational. The patient's behavior is part of the problem that brought him into the office. It constitutes the personal environment within which the therapy must take effect. It may constitute the dominant force in the total patient-doctor relationship. So whatever the patient brings into the office is in some way both a part of them and a part of their problem. The patient should be viewed with a sympathetic eye, appraising the totality that, it, that confronts the therapist. 
In doing so, therapists should not limit themselves to an appraisal of what is good and reasonable as offering a possible foundation for the therapeutic procedures. Sometimes, in fact, many more times than is realized, therapy can be firmly established on a sound basis only by the utilization of silly, absurd, irrational, and contradictory manifestations. One's professional dignity is not involved, but one's professional competence is. I think that deserves to be read and understood and perhaps reread. Yes, you'll be able to get these, and I uh, will post this, but it'll also be part of the presentation. But I'll give you a website, when, and uh, just remind me when we get to the end, and I'll, and I'll be sure to get you a copy. I meant to do that this morning, and I just forgot, but I, I will make sure that the handouts are posted online. Utilization has antecedents in traditional therapy, in traditional uh, hypnosis, we say with every sound you hear, you can go deeper and deeper. With every breath you take, you can go deeper and deeper. But um, we use it in hypnosis in ways of, uh, in different ways, in ways that it, we serve as a feedback device. So whatever emitted behavior, we utilize that. I, I think I'll demonstrate that. So as far as principles are concerned, it's the therapist trance that comes first. Whatever exists in the total weave, find a way to utilize it. Basically, whatever technique the patient uses to be a patient, the same technique can be used constructively if you can find a way. Whatever responses that you get, develop, amplify the positive. And utilization is basically the opposite of psychological problems. We could think about psychological problems as being failures of utilization. The patient believes that he doesn't have the resources to cope adequately. The patient believes that he doesn't have the resources to change. Psychological problems can be considered failures of utilization. Every smoker knows how to be comfortable without a cigarette. Every person in a bad relationship knows how to be kind and to communicate. Every person who is locked into an anxious or depressive mood has experience at changing their mood. So what we need to do is to appeal to the dormant history that exists inside the patient, because the patient has a resource, is just divorced from being able to utilize it. So when the therapist goes into a utilization state, response ready, ready to respond constructively to whatever the patient brings, the therapist is modeling something that is, by its very nature, good for the patient. If you can be in the mentality of utilization, life changes. And if Ponce de Leon was looking for the fountain of youth in Florida, Milton Erickson found it in Phoenix. And it was basically utilization. Because whatever happened, he just utilized it. There were no problems, there were no interruptions. He just found ways of utilizing whatever was happening, including his bad speech, including his paralysis, including his wheelchair, including his cane, whatever he had, he found a way to utilize it. So utilization is a therapist's posture. It's a state that we take on. And states are really important to me in, in my conceptualization of therapy, three things. We have emotions, we have moods, we have states. And by definition, emotions are, definition for example, Paul Ekman, emotions are rapid adaptive events. They're gone quickly. And there are six, depending on how you compute it, six or seven universal emotions that exist across cultures. You don't have to be taught. You're born to experience these. And, uh, you know, joy is uh, experienced in a traditional culture, like perhaps a cu culture, uh, uh, an indigenous culture in Australia. But if you showed them a picture of a sophisticated Japanese person from Tokyo, and you said, what is this emotion? And joy is joy is joy is joy, no matter where, how you've been reared. So emotions are adaptive. Moods, you could be locked into moods. Sometimes our patients come because they get into a calcified mood, like they're in a depressed mood or an anxious mood. But more often, our patients come to us because they're locked into states. And states you are, are 
could say that there were millions of states that human beings are capable of moving in and out of from time to time. And the states would be like, patient comes and they're apathetic, and you want to help them to be motivated. Or a patient comes and they're withdrawn, and you want to help them to be more engaged in life. Or a patient comes and they're hopeless, and you want to help them to have more hope and to have more goals. And basically, we help people to change our states if we have a technology for knowing how to do that. And um, I never learned when I was in graduate school that there's a technology for helping people to change states. And when I started learning hypnosis, I became convinced that there is a technology for helping people to change their state. Now one of the ways of doing that is by looking into the internal structure. We could say that depression for our purposes right now is a state. And that if you do one or a combination of these things, psychologically, socially, physiologically, linguistically, you could say, I'm depressed. If you get lost inside yourself, if you um, don't invest much social energy, if you get totally involved in your feelings, you wouldn't have to do many things on this list to say, I'm depressed. But if you do some combination of those things, you'll say, I'm depressed. Now, in order to be happy, you do some other combination of things. And basically, you take depression and you turn it upside down. Now, every depressed patient has done all of the things that are on the sap happiness side of the ledger. And so it's not a matter of teaching people how to not be depressed. It's a matter of waking up the resources that they have inside and to bring together into the mix enough components so that the person reclassifies their state. So that the patient no longer says, quote unquote, I'm depressed. The patient says, I'm happy. And it's a matter of just bringing into play those states. Now, as I said, when you're creating hypnosis, you're doing some other things. You're guiding the person's attention. You're altering the person's intensity. You're creating feelings of dissociation and you're modifying responsiveness. So in this sense, what I'm saying is that, well, depression, it's not really, doesn't really exist. It's a construct of convenience. And if you do some combination of these elements, you'll say I'm depressed. And that effectively happiness doesn't really exist. It's just a construct of convenience. If you do a certain number of elements, you'll say I'm happy. And that hypnosis, as much as I love it, doesn't exist. It's, a, it's, a, it's an unstable molecule. It's a comp compilation of psychosocial contextual factors. If you do these factors, you'll call it hypnosis. If you do other factors, you may call it meditation. The same factors in a different context, in a different way, you may call it meditation. Now, if you wake up tomorrow morning and you say it's a beautiful day in Southern California, or wherever you are, I think I'll be a traditional therapist. These are states that you would take on. If you say, I'll be a traditional hypnotist, you'll take on some other states. Now, if you say that you're going to be an Ericksonian therapist, you're going to take on some other states. And you're going to be experiential, give people experiences that help to awaken resources inside them. You're going to be dramatic. You may be a tour guide, metaphoric, thinking systemically. And certainly what you're going to do is you're going to utilize. So as a trainer of psychotherapists, having taught psychotherapy in more than 40 countries, one of the challenges for me is helping people to be better therapists and not just fill their left hemisphere with more techniques and more theories and more history. And the challenge is, how can we develop aspects of ourselves? And if we decided that utilization is something that we want to develop inside ourselves, how would we do it? And uh, we're going to do a little exercise here. It's a training exercise. It's really specific to hypnosis, but it would give you some idea of how I train students around the world when I'm trying to help them to develop states 
and not fill them with more facts and details cognitively. And because out of the six plus years that I spent with Milton Erickson, he never taught me cognitively. He was purely experiential, helping me to develop states inside myself that would help me to be a more effective Jeff Zeig. So this is about being the best therapist. We're going to do a little utilization exercise and I've pre-selected two people to help me. And if you'll come on up, Stephen and Bob. And here's what's going to happen. Bob has agreed to be the hypnotic subject. I'm sorry, Stephen has agreed to be the hypnotic subject. So he's going to sit here. Bob has agreed to be the irritant. He said that that role fit him. <laughs> uh -huh. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do an induction of hypnosis with uh, Stephen. And um, I really am not doing this for Stephen, so Stephen needs to protect himself. I'm really doing this for me because I want to develop my utilization state. I want to practice my utilization state. So what's going to happen is that Bob is going to give me two or three minutes and that after giving me two or three minutes to just work and establish some kind of context that we can call hypnosis, then he is going to be the irritant and he's going to throw something in and he's going to do eight things at irregular intervals that are going to be irritations. Like he's going to say an object in the room he may say coffee cup. And if he says coffee cup, I can't be irritated by it. Mm -hmm. I have to find a way to utilize that to advance Stephen's trance. And then he'll say another object in the room, he'll say a water bottle. And if he says water bottle, I have to utilize that to advance Stephen's trance. And then he'll say some sensation or emotion, like you say warm, or he'll say angry. And whatever sensation or emotion he says, I have to utilize that. And then he will make some sounds. <laughs> whatever sound he makes, Fun. I have to utilize that. And then he's going to say some idiosyncratic things, like he may say McDonald's hamburger. If he says McDonald's hamburger, I have to find a way to utilize that to advance Stephen Strands. And I have eight opportunities because he's going to name an object in the room, give me a moment, name another object in the room, a sensation, a sensation, a sound, a sound, two idiosyncratic items. I'm going to have eight opportunities to utilize. Now, at some of these moments, I'm going to be more elephant and at some of these moments I'm going to be more elegant. And uh, uh, what I'm looking for is for a moment like learning to ride a bicycle. There's a moment when suddenly you get it and you feel that balance and it's a visceral learning and it's not a cognitive learning. You get it. And really Steve, uh, Bob is not going to be an irritant because what he's going to do when we finish this exercise is that he's going to give me visual feedback and that when I was best in that utilization state mm -hmm. he's going to tell me one or two things that he sees okay. that will help me to solidify my utilization state. Yes. And then Stephen, he is going to not really be a, a hypnotic subject because he needs to protect himself, he's going to give me auditory feedback okay. on what I did when I was in the utilization state. So different from the way in which we would normally train hypnosis, do something with the patient, we're developing the therapist's trance. I want to develop my utilization state. I want to practice being in a utilization state. I want to know what it feels like to be in a utilization state and I want their feedback to help me solidify my utilization state so when a patient comes in immediately I'm going to be 
in that utilization state, response ready, ready to respond constructively to whatever the patient brings. And uh, we would practice this in a hypnosis class. And I know some of you don't have any experience with hypnosis. It's not the hypnosis that's relevant. It's getting into the state, feeling it, getting an experiential realization of one aspect of what can help me to be a better therapist. So, okay, so Stephen, to begin this process, one of the things that you can do is that you can just take an easy breath so that you can effortlessly close your eyes. Noticing that you can close your eyes so nicely and slowly and that you can begin to easily get the sense, the felt sense, that you can glow, grow, go inside. And that as you go inside, you can begin to discover, discover slowly and easily a sensation, perhaps a sensation of evolving comfort. And I really don't know just how now you can begin to effortlessly search inside and discover, discover in the body of your experience that there can be a real sensation of comfort that you can begin to realize in your body. And then gradually that sensation of comfort can begin to develop, that sensation of comfort can begin to grow. Because as you let yourself think back easily, effortlessly, there are memories of comfort. And for a moment, perhaps you're a little boy and you're playing outside, enjoying the warmth that you can feel in the air. Maybe, suddenly, there are memories of being in the schoolyard, playing ball really being at ease and comfortable with the people in the situation, even though it may seem something new and something strange. Palm tree. Recognizing that you can implant yourself in a way that's growing, in a way in which you can find that feeling of comfort perhaps in the palm of your hand. And that there can be memories of comfort that can be easily at your disposal in the palm of your hand. Blue shoes. Recognizing that in the soul of your experience, at the base of your experience, at the foot of your experience, there can be realizations of comfort that are really befitting of you. And the way in which those memories can continue to develop as you take an easy breath and really let yourself go. Noticing changes, changes that begin to happen as your body accommodates to the resting state. There can be fluttery sensations around your eyes, a way in which the rhythms change, how the rhythm of your breathing changes edge of my seat and how the sense of comfort can really be seated 
inside you. And how the edges of your experience no longer have the same meaning, no longer have the same importance, because the, the really important thing is you. Continuing to develop your realization of that area of comfort. Butterflies. And how things can metamorphize how the way in which the trance can feel as if you were in a cocoon of comfort. And how you can feel yourself sheltered and cocooned while your unconscious mind can continue to take flight so that those memories of comfort can continue to pervade the essence of your experience. And you're just tapping the surface of your capabilities, tapping the surface of your capacities, and learning some things about the way in which trance can be really beneficial to you, both personally and professionally. And knowing that your unconscious mind can chirp in with different memories from time to time so that when you're at work, inside yourself, when you're at home with your own sensations, that in relationship to the capacity of your own inner mind to guide you, suddenly those feelings of comfort and well-being those memories, that area of comfort, can be part of the process of your own realization. Jupiter. And how in your system you can be traveling and realizing how it can seem to you as if you jump from memory to memory. But all along that sensation of comfort, that sensation of well-being, really becomes you and becomes you in so many senses. Julie's son. And how you can continue father to father new experience and new ways that you can utilize your growing trans capacities. And then in a moment, Stephen, in a moment, I'm going to ask you to gently return, bring yourself back here, knowing that you can bring yourself back here, here now, fully now, here. Take one or two or three easy breaths. Take one or two or three easy breaths, and then bring yourself back, rested and refreshed and energetic and reoriented all over. Now, in spite of my uh, best suggestions that you don't go too far into trance, you had a very delightful experience. Uh huh. You did. Uh huh. Okay, so now we're not going to ask you about your experience because we're focusing on me. Now, how do I know that I suddenly shifted into this utilization state? So I suddenly shifted into this utilization state when I started being really attentive to you. So during that time, there was nothing in the room. There was only you and Bob. And everything else was gone. It just didn't mean anything to me. And I was in this utilization state because I was suddenly shifting into my poetic uh, use of language and moving into expressive communication rather than informative communication. I didn't want there to be any content to that for you, anything that you had to remember. It was all about guiding perceptions, guiding feelings, guiding memories, guiding realizations. And so it was a more poetic form of communication. And then I was 
um, I think more rhythmical in my speech and I knew that I was in that utilization state because I was using the prosody of my speech, the musicality of my speech in a different way. Okay, now help me, Bob. What, what did you see that I did at the moments where it seemed like I got into the utilization state? What did I do? Uh, the most striking thing for me, it was consistent across each one of my irritations, uh -huh. was, was the utter non-resistance. It's like you just right. absorbed it organically. Right. It was really remarkable. Right. It was, there was no sense of irritation. It was going to be good, bad, or indifferent, as best as I could, whatever you gave me, I was going to try to shape that yeah. to uh, foster Stephen's experience to help him develop his experience. Yes. And yes. some of the times I was more elegant and some of the times I was more elephant, elephant but it didn't really matter because I was still there, right? So, okay, so I can add this sense, kind of a Gandhian, Mahatma Gandhian sense of non-resistance, that whatever happens, whatever exists, I can meet it with a sense that Gandhi would say, satyagraha, a sense of peacefulness, a sense of uh, being open to whatever it was. Okay, now you help me. What did you hear in my voice that I can use to develop my sense of, re my state of utilization? Was there anything that you heard that was stand stood out to you? Yeah, um, I think, uh, the slow pace of the tone. The slow tone. Yeah, makes, okay. yeah, makes slowing down. Slowing down was really helpful to me because it helped me to focus on you so I can slow myself down. I can meet this non resistance, have a little image of Gandhi in my head. I can focus, I can attend, I can um, suddenly notice details, I can use poetic language. I can build my sense of being in the utilization state so that when the patient comes in, in a state of pain or difficulty, I can be there and help myself to develop utilization. So thanks to both of you. I really, you. really thanks appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is what I would do. And uh, yes, it's strange because it's, centered in hypnosis, but even in psychotherapy, whatever exists in the therapy situation, if I have a puzzle that's available to me, pick up the puzzle, utilize it. If there's uh, a style that the patient has, utilize that. Dr. Erickson ordered, autographed a book to me, to Jeff Zeig, just another book to curl your hair. Uh -huh. And uh, so, and it worked. Uh -huh. So, just to answer some questions, we have some questions, Tom. Yes, we do. Uh huh. And we have some questions here. What What do you suggest? Great. Well, I'll start off with. Uh, we're, we're kind of up against the uh, time today, and, and we're grateful for every every minute. Uh, I'll start with one from the uh, uh, from the virtual audience, and give the in person uh, audience a chance to gather the thoughts. And this one's slightly off topic, but it came in in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to ask it anyway. And you you actually alluded to it a bit. Uh, a number of students are curious in ways in which Dr. Erickson utilized his own physical challenges and symptoms to benefit his therapy. To benefit the therapy? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you remember one occasion where he wanted to discharge a patient's anger, and he didn't want the anger to be directed towards him, so he got the patient angry at his cane, and he just infuriated the patient at the cane. And I remember one example where he was trying to get into the Arcadia door and he was pushing his wheelchair and he was having trouble getting into the Arcadia door. So I ran to help him and he looked back at me and sh said sharply, no, there are some things a man needs to do for himself. So even something that simple, he was gonna turn that into an object lesson that would help me. We have a question here. Good morning, Dr. Zeig. Good morning. Just a comment. Uh, in, this, in the trial, it just concluded the George Zimmerman case in yes, Orlando. Zimmerman sorry, case. In Florida, Sanford, yeah. Florida. I was noting that perhaps unconsciously he was, quote unquote, using a lot of the techniques you talked about. In fact, I was telling a literary agent. The attorney agent, was using the, the, the Mark techniques. O'Mara. Yeah. I was telling a literary agent that this was a, a symphony of sympathy. 
uh -huh. because basically he tracked the trail with Zimmerman's, and I, I work defense, so I'm, this is not a critical, right. I'm speaking more to the subject than to right. personality. But utilization. But he tracked the trail of Zimmerman's life and basically inducted kind of a forgiveness motive with the jurors that uh -huh. were assembled. So that when it was the prosecution's time, the prosecution did not notice that they were totally in a feeling mode. The prosecution hit them with a litany of litigation rules. If you fine for this, they have to be, this has to be the stipulation. If you fine for that, mm -hmm. that's gotta be the stipulation fulfilled. Well, the jurors, all of whom are women, were in a feeling mode and the prosecution just, it was just over their heads. They didn't realize that the tone of voice that Omer used and everything that he said was a travel log to get them to feel sorry for Zimmerman. And again, th that's what the defense is supposed to do. So this is not critical. I'm just kind of in an aha. Right. Uh, Eureka, I think it's a good aha uh -huh and a good comment. I didn't follow the trial enough to be able to to to, be, to comment on the specifics, but I'd say any really good communicator is going to have elements of utilization. Yes. And what Erickson did is he just consolidated that and made that impressively central to his approach. But I'm sure the concept of utilization could be found in Sophocles and in Plato and Aristotle, and that the concept of utilization has been used by many great speakers. But what Erickson did was to distill that concept, because it exists in traditional hypnosis before Erickson. So uh, any of the ways that we can do that, we can utilize, I think makes us more powerful. And if you understand the people's you know, uh, b people's emotional side, and you want to appeal to that, you find things to utilize. We had something else? Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, good morning. Good morning. I'm Ralph Jones. I'm presently a student in Psych 87540. Mm -hmm. Just a short comment and a question. Um, your presentation, just excellent, and I see where this can promote a lot of internal peace, peace in the home and peace in the community. Absolutely. Very powerful. Uh, as a school psychologist, mm -hmm. I have to deal with many students with ADHD, mm -hmm. and I'm in the high school and realize that this is a strong indicator for academic failure. Mm -hmm. Now, how do I use utilization or help the teachers to use utilization when we are having outbursts or a lot of talkativeness and um, difficulties completing tasks. Yeah. yeah, the simplest way is in the form of a symptom prescription. So rather than challenging the student to um, stop the behavior, it is to take control of the behavior. So it would be like, can you uh, move more quickly for a few moments? Can you do this? Start to take elements of the behavior and begin to prescribe them and take charge of them rather than demanding compliance, which is really hard for that child to do. And then perhaps eventually you could turn that in a more constructive direction or at least in a direction that that wasn't disruptive to the student and to the class so that the student could begin to do some of those things, not only physically, but then could be do some things mentally and do some of those things emotionally and do some of those things in terms of their memory and um, begin to take charge but without knowing the specific student and the specific situation it's harder to come up with something to utilize but if the if the if the child is good at playing the guitar you utilize that and if the child is, loves to play baseball you utilize that so the metaphors that i would tell a child you know, would, would be specific to whatever the child's interest is. You know, when you're playing baseball, you really have to keep your eye on the ball. And when somebody is throwing that pitch to you and they're throwing it really fast, you have to slowly steady yourself. And it's a, ma a moment in which you imagine time slows down. And so you have a lot of time to react because you have made 
time slow down so that you can really focus on something that's happening, although in real time it's happening very quickly, you have made time slow down. So you have plenty of time to think and to choose how are you going to react. Maybe starting to get into a metaphor that would help the child to, to have a reference that could help them to understand how they could begin to modify their own behavior to their own advantage. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, Dr. Zeig, um, even, even as um, I, I embodied the irritant up here, I was struck <laughs> by it and it's something that occurred to me um, during the whole of your presentation. Mm -hmm. It feels like implicit in this is almost the antidote to shame. Yes. And I wondered if you might comment uh, on yes. that just a bit. Yeah. Well, you know, um, many therapists uh, find, you know, if you're working with addiction, shame is going to be something that's really central to addiction, whether or not it's recognized or not. And sometimes you may help to benefit by getting the person to feel more of the shame. You know, some problems are garlic, some problems are onion. And if you eat onion, you want to change. You want to do something different. Anxiety, depression, these are problems that are onion because you want to change, you're uncomfortable. Addiction is like garlic. If you eat garlic, you love it. It's just that other people have to deal with the stink. <laughs> right? So uh, in, in addiction, sometimes it's like a tennis match. You have to push the anxiety, the ball, into the other person's court and it may be beneficial for the addict to feel shame and to get in touch with shame. And so it may not necessarily be an antidote to shame. There's sometimes you might want to use shame to up the amount of constructive anxiety to get the person to begin to think about how they can move forward and why there would be a good reason for them to move forward. And so um, I think utilization is, is the universal solvent. So it's, it's the antidote to anger, it's the antidote to uh, bad relationships, it's the antidote to uh, uh, habits. So I, I'm in favor of utilization as that universal solvent, kind of like love is a universal solvent. Utilization is like a universal solvent. Okay, I think we have time I to sneak one in more. one more here. Yeah. Aloha. My name is Willie Taguchi. I'm a Hi. student uh, psych uh, 8750, Advanced mm -hmm. Theories of Personality. Uh, a question I have is that, uh, you know, being in the military for 43 years and being deployed and, and working with military folks, uh, people that's been traumatized, but also now, the past number of years, people with TBIs. Yes. Which, which uh, type of a traumatic brain injury, yes, TBI. especially okay. combat related. Okay. Uh, you know, they often s t tend to be parallel along with PTSD. Um, how, how would it be best to utilize what you just taught today for treatment of uh, people with, I guess, maybe at least mo moderate, uh, mild to moderate uh, TBI, right. uh, along parallel along with uh, those who've been traumatized? with uh, having PTSD. Sure. Well, the, you know, like, uh, is, uh, that's a, it's a question that would take a, a entire lecture to, to really answer, but basically with trauma, I'm thinking in terms of four stages. Like stage number one is to understand that trauma, the traumatic reaction is a normal reaction to an abnormal event. So stage one would be normalized. That may take a while for the person to really get it. Stage two would be symptom control. And then uh, you would be picking specific symptoms within the trauma complex. The trauma complex is made up of three parts. It's made up of social avoidance, it's made up of intrusions, and uh, it's made up of hyperreactivity, hyperreactivity. Hyper so to find out in those three quadrants what are the specific symptoms of the person and try to utilize some of those symptoms and you know sensitivity is good so how can you turn hypersensitivity into sensitivity and find a way of utilizing it stage three would be doing things that were recidivism um, that tried to prevent recidivism so that the person felt like they were capable of dealing with future situations without going back into uh, a traumatic situation and stage four would be a search for meaning how can you become resilient how can you know that the trial that you have just endured 
is a way that will help you to live a more meaningful life and be more meaningful not only to yourselves but meaningful to others. So it's that is the more global utilization that you can utilize what the horror that you've been through to help yourself and to help others to be a little bit better. And so that's like Viktor Frankl, that last stage is centering on how you can create meaning. And Viktor Frankl certainly, being in five different concentration camps, was a credible source when he talked about that, that um, it, what Nietzsche said, if you had a why, you can endure any how. If you, if you can find a way that even before he went into the concentration camp, he had written the outlines of Man's Search for Meaning, and he used the concentration camp as a test of his theory. Could he endure that trauma uh, by thinking forward about making that meaningful, not knowing whether or not he would survive? So thank you so much, and uh, being such a wonderful audience. And